Thank you, Zamakudu. Okay, so welcome uh, everyone. I have a big honor and responsibility of introducing Professor Zina Hitz. Um, uh, well, I mean, m probably most of you, if not all of you, have heard of her by now. She is a professor, a tutor at St. John's College. She has written well, a book on the pleasures of intellectual life and a more recent one about the religious life, right? Um, and she uh, also founded um, an NGO, uh, which is a kind of a great books program entirely online. So um, people meet online and discuss great texts. Um, today, she will offer us um, a conference about learning, liberation and consolation. So I'm just giving the word to Zina and can maybe discuss and talk with her a bit at the end. Yeah, I'm going to stand up because I think I speak better that way. Um, first of all, thank you all for coming. I'm extremely happy to be here in this uh, beautiful building, uh, which is where they are sort of living my dream of having a uh, library and center open to anybody. Um, and uh, I've had wonderful hospitality from everyone about Toria, especially Father Francisco and Madalena. Uh, so, thanks to everyone who made this possible. Uh, so, the, the, the talk is uh, on the themes which I am best known for, on leisure, learning, uh, liberation, and consolation. Uh, the consolation is a bit underdeveloped, so you can, just hinting, that would be a good thing to ask me questions about. Uh, I begin with uh, Augustine's Confessions. In the Confessions, Augustine describes a fascinating moment in his conversion to the Catholic faith. At this time, he's a successful teacher of rhetoric in Milan. He's living with his longtime concubine and their son. He has a group of close friends with whom he talks about things. He is in the middle of breaking or about to break with the Manichaeans, the uh, Gnostic cult that he's spent many years with studying and teaching. And he finds himself overwhelmed by the limits of human understanding and skeptical that anyone could know the truth about how to live. So he's oscillating at this time back and forth between skepticism that anything at all can be known and his interest that's growing in the Catholic faith. Um, and the latter is nourished by his friendship with uh, Ambrose, the Bishop of Milan. So here is how he describes a dialogue he has with himself at this time. This is a Saint Augustine talking. It's a long quote, but I'll, I'll talk you through it. Okay. So here's Augustine. Tomorrow I shall find it. See, it will be perfectly clear and I will, have no doubt, I will have no more doubts. Faustus, this is the great Manichaean intellectual, will come and explain everything. So at this moment, Augustine is sure that the Manichaean system is going to work. He just needs to understand one more little thing. But then he shifts in a different direction. What great men the academic philosophers were, these are the skeptical philosophers. Nothing for the conduct of life can be a matter of assured knowledge. Yet let us, this is still Augustine, yet let us seek more diligently and not lose heart. The books of the church we know not to contain absurdities. The things which seemed absurd can be seen in another way which is edifying. Let me fix my feet on that step where as a boy I was placed by my parents until clear truth may be found. But where can truth be sought? So there he's leaning Catholic but hesitating. And this, is, this next part is, the, I, I think, the, in a way, the most interesting and the most human. When can it be sought? Ambrose has no time. There is no time for reading. Where should we look for the books that we need? Where and when can we obtain them? From whom can we borrow them? Fixed times must be kept free and hours appointed for the health of the soul. Great hope has been aroused. Why do we hesitate to knock at the door which opens the way to all the rest? 
Our pupils occupy the mornings. What should we do with the remaining hours? Why do we not investigate our problem? Uh, but then, when should we go to pay respect to our more influential friends whose patronage we need? When are we to prepare what our students are paying for? When are we to refresh ourselves by allowing the mind to relax from the tensions of anxiety? So Augustine's language in the Confessions can be lofty and remote, but this is one of his great human moments. He wants to know how to live. Really, he does. He's totally preoccupied with this question. Uh, he's, he's not talking about the things that might really be worrying him, that he might discover a truth that would suggest that he should change his career or that would require him to leave his family. He really, he doesn't have time. He's just too busy between his students and patrons. Ambrose is too busy. Everyone's too busy. He doesn't have time to read. He doesn't have time to get the books. Too bad for Augustine. He can't figure out the right way to live. He's just too busy. Earlier in the same section of the Confessions, Augustine describes how busy Ambrose, the bishop, is. Bishops at that time were expected to adjudicate disputes between members of their flock ad infinitum. They were, in fact, incredibly busy. Yet Augustine describes with reverence what Ambrose does in the short moments in which he does not have an appointment. He reads silently. He doesn't restrict access to visitors. He doesn't shut the door. He sits and reads and passes his eyes over the page. And here is the famous passage where Augustine describes this. When Ambrose read, his eyes traveled across the page and his heart sought into the sense, but voice and tongue were silent. No one was forbidden to approach him, nor it is his custom to require that visitors be announced. But when we came into him, we often saw him reading and always to himself. And after we had sat along in silence, unwilling to interrupt a work on which he was so intent, we could depart again. We guessed that in the small time he could find for the refreshment of his mind, he would wish to be free from the distraction of other men's affairs and not called away from what he was doing. So in Augustine's description, Ambrose has chosen to use these spare snatches of time to return within himself and to become a kind of island of stillness. His reading, it seems, is a kind of prayer. It may even be a prayer. But either way, it seems to be an example of what I is called traditionally leisure. So I'm going to talk a bit about leisure in the next section of this conference. What is leisure? And why might it be necessary for a human life? Or why might it be important? The leisure that I'm interested in is not lounging at the beach or a festive party or enjoying a coffee in a beautiful courtyard. Um, the leisure that is interesting to me is not just a break from real life. It's not just a place where we rest or restore ourselves to prepare ourselves for more work. But what I'm after is something that looks like the culmination of a life. So some activity in which it feels like my life culminates. So uh, if it isn't too patronizing, I would ask you to each ask yourselves, what part of your life seems to be the culminating part? What days or hours or minutes where you seem to be living life to the fullest? When do you stop counting time and become fully present to what you're doing? When do you think to yourself, oh yes, the asteroid could hit in a minute and I would just be, this would be enough. What sorts of activities are you engaged in when this takes place? We do, most of what we do, I think we do for the sake of something else, instrumentally. You eat breakfast because otherwise you'll be hungry. You exercise to stay healthy. You work for money. Uh, um, other things you do for their own sake. You play cards, go for hikes, spend time with your family, read, build model airplanes. And some things are evidently both instrumental and for their own sake. We work for money, but we also sometimes love our work activities. Think about a professional musician. 
Um, in a way, they work for money and for a living. In another way, what they're doing is some kind of fulfillment of who they are. We fish to eat, but we also fish because we like the sport. Uh, we play cards for fun and to connect with others, but also just to unwind and let our minds rest. We have many goals um, and activities, often at the same time. But certain goals have a priority over others. They have a structuring or an ordering effect over others. So for instance, in the most ordinary way, we choose our career to permit more leisure time with our family. It's a common kind of choice. Or the other way around, you choose a less demanding family to allow free upward growth in your career. Our ultimate end, which is family in the first case, success in the second, frames and structures or other pursuits. We trade a freer schedule for more money, or we sacrifice a higher salary for more time to pursue our heart's desire. This suggests this kind of structuring or ordering, trading of one thing for another, suggests that we might have a basic orientation some kind of ultimate end or goal that structures our other choices. Such a goal is somehow implicitly or explicitly our highest good. Whether we've chosen it or not, whether we've thought about it or not, it might have just grown haphazardly out of whatever you happen to be doing on autopilot, inward pressure, social pressure, what have you. But nonetheless, it's the thing which, when you make choices, you put first. Um, so the highest good or ultimate ends that you choose might be wealth or status or family life or serving your community, the enjoyment of the natural world or knowledge of God or writing novels or the pursuit of mathematical truth. It could be any number of these things. And we might not know, most importantly, we might not know what in the soup of all of the things that we desire and want and like and enjoy, which of, our, which of those things matters most to us. And we, I think we discover it in times of trial or crisis, you know, when there's a difficult choice at work, uh, a family member in the hospital, uh, death in the family, when we face sickness, poverty, or moral compromise, tends to be when the, something clarifies for us about who we are and what, what matters most. So what would happen uh, if we tried? I don't think anyone actually tries to do this, but I think it does happen fairly commonly. What would happen if our lives were organized around merely instrumental pursuits? So we're not very likely to order our lives around grocery shopping or paying taxes, but say earning money or making the world a better place, or um, even in the way that say Ambrose does through his pastoral work as a bishop. So Aristotle, who's uh, one of the philosophers I've learned the most from my studies, he argued that our ultimate end uh, should be sought for its own sake, or our, or our actions would turn out to be empty and vain. So it's clear enough that my actions are empty and vain when I don't get the thing that my instrumental activity is aiming for. So if I pack up all my things to go swimming and drive to the pool or the lake, um, but the facility is closed or there's a thunderstorm or for whatever reason I can't swim, then my actions have been in vain. They've been frustrated. They're empty. But it's also true that if my ultimate goal is not sought for its own sake, my actions are in vain. So suppose that the pool is open or the, the weather is good. I get to swim. Why do I do it? Well, I swim for the sake of health, let's say. Why do I want to be healthy? I want to be healthy so that I can work. Why do I want to work? I want to work to earn money. Um, what's the money for? Well, it's for the sake of what I pay my bills, the food, the drink, the housing, the recreation, and the exercise, all the things that make it possible for me to work. So I said that quickly, but I think it should be clear in a second that what I've described is a life of utter futility. So if I work for the sake of money and spend the money on necessities, and then my life is organized around working, my life is a pointless spiral of work for the sake of work. So it's like buying uh, 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 cream tart, OK? 
okay, then selling it for cash, and then buying another cream tart, and then selling it for cash. <laughs> just going on and on and on forever. So, um, I'm very proud of myself for having adapted from ice cream, which is the original, which no one eats here, but to cream tart, which is a classic Portuguese dessert. So, I'm just joking. Okay, uh, so it's just as tragic or more as working for money and getting crushed by a falling piano on your way to cash your paycheck. Activities are not worthwhile unless they culminate in something or unless they're satisfying in themselves. So for this reason, Aristotle argued that there must be some activity or activities beyond work, leisure, for the sake of which we work and without which our work would be in vain. Leisure is not just recreation. It's not just something we do for the sake of work, to rest or relax so that we work even better. Um, it's an activity or set of activities that could count as the culmination of our endeavors. And for Aristotle, only contemplation could be ultimately satisfying this way. So there might be other things which we had implicitly as our highest good, like wealth or status or et cetera, or work, but the only thing that could really satisfy us, that could really structure our desires in a way that made sense, would be the activity of contemplation. And Aristotle has many arguments for this, most of which I won't pay any attention to. Um, but for him, contemplation is the activity of seeing and understanding and savoring the world as it is. So that's, that's a sort of philosophical account of what leisure is, um, sort of a sketch, philosophical sketch of, of what leisure might look like and why it might matter. But I think to uh, really take it on, it's best to think about what uh, it looks like in, in real life, in real people's lives. Um, so I'll use some examples which are kind of dramatic, but sometimes drama helps to clarify something. Um, so here are some examples of what I think is leisure. Um, first, okay. The Russian dissident Irina Ratushinskaya used poetry as a form of resistance during her imprisonment by Soviet authorities in the early 1980s. On the transport uh, train to the prison, at any point with contact with other prisoners, she would recite poems, original or classic. Prisoners would write out memorized poems on scraps of paper and exchange them with one another whenever they had the chance. When Ratushinskaya was denied writing materials by her captors, she scratched her poems onto bars of soap with matchsticks, and then she would wash them away when she had memorized them. When she had cigarette paper, she transferred them to the cigarette paper, and they were smuggled out of prison to the West. Uh, the Romanian writer Irina Dumitrescu writes about Romanian political prisoners, also, this is also a 20th century example, who taught each other Morse code and tapped out poetry through the walls. Some taught each other languages when using a piece of string to code letters, uh, knots in a piece of string. One Romanian officer in Siberia made ink out of blackberries and wrote out French poems he had memorized in school. More than one such prisoner referred to their time in prison as a university. Um, these examples, the example like this is not quite as unusual as you might think. I, I collect, at least I collect them. So uh, here's another one. Andre Ve, the mathematician and brother of Simone Ve, the philosopher, was imprisoned by the Vichy government for refusing to serve in the army. And while in prison, he undertook a major mathematical proof, uh, the Remine hypothesis for curves under finite fields. And he joked that only in prison could he have achieved this kind of work. Um, so, uh, and one more example, uh, the African-American activist Malcolm X entered prison as a man named Malcolm Little, the defiant hedonist addicted to drugs, reliance on petty crime. His father had been murdered by a white man when he was a child, and his family had been broken up by the local welfare office. Long studies in the prison library and conversations with a self-educated inmate changed him. He began to read, first the dictionary, then books on etymology and linguistics. He studied elementary Latin and German. 
He converted to Islam, a faith introduced to him by his brothers. And in the following years, he read the Bible, the Quran, Nietzsche, Schopenhauer, Spinoza, and Kant, as well as works of Asian philosophy. He learned the history of colonialism, slavery, and African peoples. He felt his old ways of thinking disappear, as he put it, like snow off a roof. He left prison as a minister in the Nation of Islam and as a powerful spokesman for the African-American communities that were most beaten down by poverty and violence that was fed by racial prejudice. So there's something a little strange going on. Let me step back for a second. Um, we started with this example of Augustine, who at, this, at the time of his life, when discussed, is very successful. He's, he's teaching rhetoric to the wealthy in a flourishing city of the Roman Empire in Italy. Um, he has his whole future ahead of him. There's nothing um, in principle holding him back from undertaking a leisurely inquiry of the kind that in some way he really wants to do. In fact, I think it's a little mysterious and worth talking about what exactly is holding him back? What is the source of the resistance? Um, but these, these uh, prisoners who I've talked about, they're in the worst circumstances anyone could imagine. They're far from successful. They're the opposite of successful. They've been faced with the worst thing anyone could uh, do, but sometimes quite the, his, the political prisoners quite deliberately, um, the worst circumstances that could be applied to them. Uh, and yet somehow these people find the capacity for leisure under pressure, so to speak, um, in a way that someone in a more comfortable circumstances seems to struggle with. And that's not to suggest that uh, people in those harsh circumstances wouldn't also struggle or might not be able to do what these people did, but you somehow you see something uh, shine out that, that isn't as obvious in ordinary life. So in examples of the flourishing of a leisured intellectual life, even in social isolation or relative poverty, extend far past the walls of prisons. So consider an ordinary bookworm, a young person, who retreats from the slings and arrows of social life to think or to learn or to ponder or to imagine or to read. Or at a different level, consider the case of Albert, famous case of Albert Einstein, who was unable to find an academic job in physics. So he took a job in a patent office and in this little room, which he called his, his worldly cloister, he wrote the three papers that uh, made him very famous. Um, consider, uh, well, this is one of my favorite cases, John Baker, uh, who's a lover of literature. This is a person of the 40s and 50s, 20th century. Uh, lover of literature without a college degree. He worked at an office job at the Automobile Association of Essex in England. In his spare time, he stalked peregrine falcons over Essex by bicycle for 10 years, carrying maps, taking voluminous notes, 10 years before consolidating his work into a poetic masterpiece that was published in 1967. These men and women I have described pursued intellectual activity, leisured activity, outside of universities with an intensity that's not always found within them or even rarely found within them. So uh, the Christian parallel to the studious prisoners takes its most famous form in images of the Virgin Mary at the arrival of the angel Gabriel. I wish I had slides, but I, I didn't ask for them. <laughs> so if you go to your favorite museum and look at any image of the Annunciation, the, when, the Gabe, when Gabriel appears the Virgin Mary, you will see her holding books, most likely. So in this tradition dated from the second century and influencing uh, Christian art and literature through the Renaissance, Mary was an avid reader, especially of the Holy Scriptures. Her reading symbolized for the authors and artists her wisdom and so the freedom with which she consented to bear the Messiah. The enclosed or sheltered surroundings that you see in these images symbolize the ascetic cost of that wisdom. Somehow this wisdom or this leisure grows in silence, solitude, deprivation, and sacrifice. So um, I'll say this too. So the bookworms escape the thoughtful prisoners, the isolated bird watcher, 
evoke these Christian, Catholic, and Orthodox contemplative traditions, the desert retreat, the platform on the pillar, the cell of the monk or the nun. Now, the Christian versions of poverty or failure or confinement have a necessary supernatural character. So they're depicting somehow the communion of the individual soul with God. But forms of asceticism, of sacrifice and silence and solitude, they're found in a broad swathe of global religious traditions with different theological premises. I think asceticism, this kind of sacrifice or the seeking out of silence or poverty or, or solitude, has its basis in our humanity, in our human elements. Um, it's the, there are forms of discipline which cultivate what's best in us. Um, and what's best in us, I don't mean only intellectual excellence or the capacity to read or to think, but the ability to recover one's dignity from the common diminishments of social life and to form communities with others on the basis of that dignity rather than on the basis of social use. And this kind of dignity or community is by not any means reserved to Einstein's or brilliant poets. Uh, they're a common human heritage. So I use these examples because um, they're easy to find out about, because uh, they're in books, because they're famous people. But I think this kind of phenomenon I'm talking about is much more widespread than that. OK. Uh, I need to say something about liberation. <laughs> So I hope I don't run out of time. Uh, so I've described uh, some unusual examples of people who, who pursue leisure in the form of an intellectual life, a kind of love of learning pursued for its own sake. Cultivating that love of learning and training its exercise is what is called by, um, even in my world, an old-fashioned name, liberal learning. Now, uh, liberal uh, is a common word in a variety of contexts. It doesn't mean, in this case, uh, connected with free market economics. It doesn't mean um, a characteristic of the left wing in American politics. It means learning that is meant for freedom. So it's liberal in its original etymological sense. Learning that, that, that uh, cultivates, promotes, aims at freedom. And it includes uh, the humanities, literature, philosophy, history, political theory. But mathematics and science can also be forms of leisure, can also be pursued freely. And so my interest is broader than that. So what makes this type of free, the idea that it might cultivate, certain kinds of study might cultivate freedom uh, is what makes, I think, the love of learning for its own sake different from, say, the pursuit of sports for its own sake, or the pursuit of walking in the woods for its own sake, or making model ships out of toothpicks for its own sake. So it's, it's something which I think might be closely connected with learning, uh, as distinct from other kinds of, of leisure or other kinds of, of um, important human activities. So what do I mean by freedom? It's not obviously not a word that stands on its own. Uh, as something without explanation. And it's particularly puzzling because most of the people I've discussed are prisoners. They have highly restricted choices. In some obvious sense, they have freedom is exactly what they don't have. So what would count as slavery or unfreedom if people like this are free, people like these prisoners are free? So I mentioned earlier that we can fall into the trap of work for the sake of work, pursuing the instrumental without it culminating in anything. Um, and one of the ways this happens, it seems to me most commonly, I mean, it's a little mysterious why it should happen at all. Uh, it's something I try to think about. But I think the most obvious, common, and also most dangerous form is the pursuit of the instrumental goods of wealth and status. For some reason, these particular goods have a kind of enchanting effect on us. So wealth and status are good. They're good for as instruments for other things. Um, wealth can help to uh, build a library or 
a concert hall or um, help to provide people with lives of, of basic health or comfort or convenience that can provide excellent medical care. Uh, wealth is a, a very important instrument. Uh, so is status. If you think of any person who's prominent of high status, who you think has done something courageous or noble or heroic, that's someone who's used their status for the sake of some good. They've used it as a means to an end. Um, so, uh, but wealth and status for some reason have, uh, as I say, an enchanting effect. And I can only point to some uh, signs of this enchantment. I can't explain it in its depth. So one, uh, consider a prestigious, uh, sorry, I've lost my capacity to speak. A prestigious academic center in my home country um, was in the news recently. Uh, who ha they had research projects that included converting the patterns of nature and the human body into beneficial signals and energy, designing wearable systems for cognitive enhancement, advancing justice in Earth's complex systems using designs enabled by space. It's th there's not a language barrier that makes those impossible to understand. <laughs> they don't make sense. Uh, they're, they're gimmicky, slick. It's not obvious that in any way or transparent what life would be improved by such projects, how they would work. Um, where do they come from? Where does this kind of language comes from? It comes from money, it comes from prestige, via the language of the media splash, the public relations coup, um, the effort to sound, to make a, to make a noise uh, a signal that's heard in the midst of a, a sea of advertising, right? It's, it's advertising language. So this is a, a, just a sign of some ways in which I think wealth and status can be enchanting. Here's another, uh, this is more common uh, and maybe more familiar. Uh, the growth of what sociologist David Graeber calls bullshit jobs. Um, these are jobs which, um, involve pretending to do something important but produce no tangible good. So they're not, they're often high prestige, highly paid. They're not the same as a bad job. Bad jobs are often very important <laughs> for, for human flourishing, like uh, waste collection and so on. Um, but, so these are high prestige, high paid jobs. But they, for instance, you might have a job um, making sure that certain requirements are met um, but no one actually checks to see whether you've done your work, um, and no one actually cares whether or not those requirements are met. There's quite a lot of jobs that are like that. Box checking jobs is what Graeber calls them. Um, or pretending to fix things that in fact can't be fixed or that no one wants to be fixed. Um, so the examples, Graeber wrote a short essay online about this and then got a flood of amazing letters from real people describing their work. And one example was a in from Germany, a subcontractor to a subcontractor to the military. And his job was to drive long distances, to move furniture from one room to another, to make sure that the relevant paperwork for the furniture moving was filled out. There was a, there's an incredible story, a heartbreaking story, of a man who's hired to patch a problem that the two leaders of the company have a dispute about. So one of them wants it fixed and the other one doesn't. So he's hired as a kind of peace offering. So his only thing he can't do is fix the problem because <laughs> then the conflict <laughs> opens up again. So he's paid and paid well and has a fancy title and he's paid to do absolutely nothing. So he, he starts reading novels, he starts drinking on the job, he starts abusing his company accounts, he can't get fired, uh, he, you know, he tries to quit, he gets a raise. It's a kind of hilarious, it's an amazing story. But the, what's, what's also important about these stories that I think really comes out in Graeber's book, his analysis I don't agree with in, all the, in, in every way, but these people are miserable. Um, you might think it's the perfect job to have lots of money and lots of status and not have to work. But in fact, these people are dying inside. They want something that matters. Um, okay. So research that entertains um, uh, wealthy board members or work that creates an appearance of productivity. These are just some examples of the kind of unfreedom 
that liberal learning seeks to counter. If you work in these contexts, your work is for the ends of others. You're not just a cog in the machine, which is a very familiar image to us from the 20th century industrial age, right? Um, if you're a cog in the machine, at least you're being used for, a common, for the common good in some way. Um, but you're used to, being, to create an appearance that makes someone money or permits someone to make money. And there's no salary or no degree of social standing, it seems to me, that can compensate for this kind of diminishment of a human being. Um, so, um, okay, I'm all right. It's much more dignified, although less lucrative or prestigious, to train oneself for work that serves an evident need in a community. Learning how to build homes or offices, bridges or roads, to make communities safe or sanitary or comfortable or beautiful. Um, that's, these are real needs. Training in medical care. Um, these are things which help a person to contribute to the, the real human needs of people around them. Our communities would collapse without this kind of work. Um, and many other useful kinds of work that don't require much training. So uh, despite the overwhelming importance of work like this that I've just described, those two are, are not sufficient for a full human life for the reasons I discussed at the beginning. They are still instrumental. Um, if you, um, life is more than food or shelter or medical care. So there are cases where, especially in my home country, where um, you, could, you could dedicate your life to providing food and not have enough food to eat yourself, or you, know, you could be a home health aide yet not be able to afford health insurance. So there are cases where you're providing for the common good but deprived of it yourself. Um, but even when you are actually participating, you're actually getting up some piece of this good that the work you're talking about is producing, it's still not enough to make for a full human life. If you try to imagine a society or a community that had no art, no music, no study, no literature, no festivals, no celebrations, no religion, uh, you would not be seeing a really full human society. There, all of these things, all of these human necessities have to culminate in something else. So the truth is, just to summarize this last section about work, um, we're exposed to different professions and professional training without reference to the ultimate good that they serve uh, or without careful thinking about it. So am I building an apartment complex for people to live in or an investment complex that will make investors money while the market's high but be left an empty shell in a matter of months? One form of building serves the common good, the other doesn't. Is the healthcare I'm learning to practice focusing on healing the sick? improving the lives of the disabled, comforting the elderly, or is it a form of cosmetics or eugenics um, for some people to distinguish themselves from other, other people? So liberal learning, to get back to liberal learning, sir, in it, uh, <laughs> of the kind I'm concerned with, was this, it, the egalitarian form of liberal learning, which cultivates freedom in the, as a, uh, the resources for dignity in a human person that can be used in any circumstance, was conceived and developed in the late 19th and early 20th centuries in, in this particular form that I, that I know well. Uh, that was when a large and growing class of laborers and immigrants sought to improve their lives by appropriating to themselves the learning of the aristocrats through the great books and the classics. They were aided by printing technology that permitted the mass market paperback and a vast industry in translating classics into the languages of the world. So that meant that books reserved for centuries for a few suddenly became accessible to anyone who could read. So working men and women in the UK and the US, these are the places where I've studied the history, but I think it's, there are many other cases worldwide. They formed clubs and groups, formal and informal, to educate themselves and one another on the fundamental human questions. They sought citizenship and political rights as well as greater economic freedom, but they also sought learning for its own sake to escape from the diminishments of factory work or other labor that traditionally is called servile, labor that's for the sake of something else. Liberal learning relies on the principle that I am most free when I exist in some sense for my own sake. 
I choose the end for which I work. I have some activity within myself, which matters. Um, which in Kant's language, it glitters like a jewel. Um, so uh, it's uh, a source of, it constitutes, I think, in some way what I'm calling freedom. It comes from within a person. Uh, it's an, it, it often is a source of resistance to outside diminishment. Uh, it's a, uh, something inward, something that can't be taken from you. Um, so uh, that's not a fully adequate account of what freedom is, but I have to do for now because I'm running out of time. Um, actually, that's just a lie. I, don't, I, couldn't, I couldn't give a better account, but it's always good to run out of time. <clears throat> so I want to conclude with a bit of a question. Um, so why is this, this freedom that I've tried to sketch, at least with images and examples, the freedom to live for one's own sake, to pursue a meaningful life and consider the value of, of one's own ends, uh, why is it something difficult? So why is it rare such that someone achieves it maybe only in prison or after a catastrophic failure of some kind? Um, I think it's in part this mysterious enchantment that instrumental tasks have um, and the, the way in which they're lavished with money and status, which also has this enchanting effect. But Augustine, if we go back to Augustine at the beginning, he fears, um, quite evident, if you listen to the passage, his voice in the passage, the anxiety is very palpable. He, pers he really fears pursuing what he cares about most. Um, so th there's some kind of emptiness in him that he doesn't want to face. And I, I don't know what exactly that is, but I, I, I think it's interesting and worth noting. So the freedom that learning cultivates is also, should be obvious from the examples, a source of consolation. So if we think um, about education for job training, which has been hovering in the background of my talk without being really much talked about, um, it, if it endangers the kind of freedom that I've talked about by plugging you into um, a system of money and status, which might in the end not make sense, it also promises success without necessarily providing sources for consolation and failure. So it's uh, learning for its own sake that I think is one of the key sources of leisure, of meaning in a human life, uh, an important source of freedom, and also a key source of consolation. With that, I'll stop and take your questions. Thank you. Okay, so now the floor is yours. If you have any questions that you'd like to uh, make, just raise your hand and please wait for the microphone, right? So that your voice is properly recorded. Hi, uh, this is about what you just said, actually. Um, you said that uh, this uh, mindset of uh, pursuing wealth and status, it promises success without sources of consolation for failure. Did I get you right? That yeah, you? that's what I just said. Could you, could you elaborate on that? <laughs> Especially the consolation for, for failure. What about, and what about consolation for success as well, the, the two of them? Oh, sure. So, um, yeah, I think it, at the end of the day, you need consolation and success as well as in failure. Um, but I, the, um, because there's something about the terms of the success and failure that's that's superficial and that doesn't get to the depths of what a human being is. Um, but uh, I suppose what I'm thinking about is is the rhetoric. At least I, I hope it's not as bad here as it is back home. But um, you know, education for success, 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 leadership, leadership, leadership. Um, let's, you know, let's educate the leaders for tomorrow for their success. Uh, <laughs> and they, if they're successful, then they'll be leaders. So um, there's, it's almost unimaginable that you would fail or not be a leader. 
And that could happen through some fault of yours, or it could happen through no fault of yours. We all know that um, life is uncertain and you know what's up today is down tomorrow and vice versa. So one of the, it seems to me, the really um, profound gifts of a liberal education is that you have resources within yourself no matter what happens. You're a political prisoner, you're um, impoverished, you're in the worst circumstances you can imagine, but you have something within yourself to draw on. And that's a source of consolation. It's, it's a, I'm also calling it a kind of freedom, but it has something to do with consolation also. Um, and um, it doesn't, it's not somehow saying, um, I'm not a stoic, so I don't think somehow the loss of those things doesn't matter. Uh, but it, it does, uh, it, it consoles you, it comforts you, it, it gives you something to, to, to rest in when things go wrong. It's also true that um, I think successful people who, in that conventional sense, who have no other source of their own value are, um, are very unhappy people. That's my experience. So, so you also, and there also tend to be difficult. I mean, I'm, now I'm thinking they're also difficult to work with a little bit of my experience, but that's beside the point. Um, they, that the people who are successful, who have a sense of why their success might or might not matter, who have a sense that there's more to life than success, and that maybe it was lucky chance anyway that they brought them to success, that seems to me a very healthy way to succeed. And that too can be um, cultivated by this type of learning, by having within yourself this, this sense of uh, th these resources for imagining who you are and how you relate to others, which aren't dependent on your social circumstances. Thank you. Hi, great talk. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, really enjoyed it. Um, I was I was thinking while I was hearing you and when I read your book too. I was uh, I also thought about Joseph Pieper's book on leisure, and he, there he sort of uh, sketches the historical. Um, um, I mean, the history of leisure and the way we look at leisure, and he says that with Kant. Uh, there's this notion of leisure starting to look more like work. <laughs> and what I wanted to ask you is whether in universities an institutionalized leisurely life, <laughs> um, um, you think there's this uh, tendency to look at leisure in, as work, as, as a sort of painful thing that you must do, <laughs> and what does that do to our capacity to uh, deal with failure, namely? Um, yeah, it's it's quite interesting, and it's part of other versions of this talk that are where I, I'm. This is, you know, the doors are open to anybody. But I sometimes give talks at universities where there's more necess necessarily a concentrated academic audience. So th there, I always feel obligated to say that an academic life is not not in not only not necessarily leisurely, but in fact often less leisurely than. Um, the, the intellectual lives of non-academics. So um, I, people who work, uh, who I know who work regular jobs and read philosophy in their spare time, they do so with more joy, more consolation, more leisure. It's the culmination of their life. Whereas, I, I don't know if I, I haven't worked through Pieper's analysis of this intellectual work and the historical account of it, so I'm not sure if I agree with every part of it, but he's definitely right that, um, and that's partly because academics are, are extremely status conscious. So um, I believe more status conscious than maybe any other. I mean, maybe I've never worked with movie stars. Maybe they're worse. Uh, but um, I, don't, I don't know. I, I suspect not, honestly. Um, the, because of that, that sort of enchantment of status, um, and because also the, the institutional constraints have have generated um, a certain amount of job that's amount of the job that's bullshit. So, so that's managing people, that's checking boxes, that's filling out forms. It doesn't make any sense. That has no connection to the core mission of of the university. For that reason, it it it, it is the, some of the most unhappy people who I know are academics who got into it because they thought it was a leisurely activity, and it's the leisure's been sucked out of it. 
So it's it's not impossible, but it's extra, I think it's quite difficult. Actually, I think it, I think um, it's much harder than it should be to find leisure in a university, even though the university's existence was once you know to to keep leisure alive. Um, that help? Thanks. So one thing that intrigued me from, from your talk was when you described uh, rest um, as a moment to repair um, our dignity from the social, in in social interactions. I, I, I think now from your answers that by social interactions, maybe you mean these kinds of status ex exchanges and so on, but, but I also thought that maybe that, that idea of like restoring and repairing our own dignity has to do with consolation that you mentioned in the end. So do you want to pick up on that? <laughs> yes, so I oh, I thought you were going to ask about something else. Maybe So maybe you can clarify your question if this doesn't answer it. I thought you were asking about um, other people. So the, I, cause I, I think I've caused confusion in my writing before because there really is, I think, this uh, inbuilt thing in us that focuses on social competition, where social life is a matter of status. Um, and it's, I think it's more or less, it, it's not up to us. It's sort of an inevitable part of our nature. We have to discipline ourselves against it. But of course, that's not the only way of relating to other people. Um, so once one has recovered, one's, once one has a source of dignity, once one has a, a sense of oneself and a, a, a sense of freedom, then one can connect with other people on that basis which is a, a much more um, a deeper form of human connection than you would find in the realm of competition. So, so I did want to clarify that. I don't, but I don't think that was. No, uh, so, so maybe. Explain yeah. again what your question was. No, I think I think that's that's connected with that. Because I was intrigued that, um, well, not not all people enjoy being like sit in silence. Um, right. And so, are you claiming that they, even if they don't particularly enjoy it, then there, there's something missing on them, so that they would be able to enjoy that, because that would be that would help them repair their dignity, or is it just, or is it just a matter of, as you were saying, our social life depends on these types of interactions, which are very demanding on us, and we need to step away from them a bit, so that we can perhaps return in a different way. Okay, I. I don't think that, um, I think that everyone needs to have some uh, discipline or some way of escaping from this social competition. Um, and I don't think truthfully anyone really likes solitude or silence. Um, I think the initial encounter with solitude or silence is, uh, Anxiety, boredom, frustration. Um, I mean, it, it can make you feel almost crazy to be in solitude and in silence. Um, and I think that's true for everyone. So th th that's why I think there's a kind of a, di I, I describe it in the forms of discipline or even asceticism. That is, you, like anything difficult, it, it's painful at the beginning and then something happens, um, which, um, which helps you to find something in yourself. Um, I don't, I do think that there are differences among individuals and I don't think that the same practice of withdrawing is, I don't think it's going to be the same for everyone. Um, but I, I do think that everyone needs something like that, mm -hmm. something that performs that function. Maybe it's not sitting in a quiet room by yourself in silence. <laughs> maybe it's something else. Maybe it's going out into nature, or maybe it's um, uh, reading books, or maybe it's doing math in your head, or it's something. I, I, I don't know all the forms it can take, um, but I think everyone has to do it uh, in order to find their dignity. I don't think you can find it otherwise. But it might be easier for some people than for others. I, I wouldn't deny that either. I think.
Come on, guys. <laughs> okay, so you, you guys, if you agree with everything, that's fine. That's great. Hi, hello. I was curious when you were speaking about the, the, the consolation and uh, the way, because you spoke about the bad ways to consolation, but also how do you view the, the, the path to good consolation and the importance of consolation? That, uh, that was one of the parts that I was intrigued with. Well, I, I can say a bit more. Um, so one, maybe a distinction that might be useful to make, I, just like leisure is not is different from just um, taking a break, you know, watch, you know, binging Netflix or what have you. I think consolation and distraction are different from one another. So, um, you you might, in terrible circumstances, distract yourself, and that might be really necessary. I mean, no one, no, I'm not, I'm not against distraction, um, but. I think that for it to be consolation, it has to somehow uh, counteract whatever the form of the suffering is. Okay? So it has to be, it, it has to actually console you. Um, and, and consolation is also interesting because it doesn't, uh, it can it can exist in quite a lot of pain and suffering and grief, right? So I sometimes I've been mystified by this. So if you think about someone who's suffered a terrible loss, you know, and um, if you've been in circumstances like that, you know that nothing nothing can take that away from you. It's it's this you feel like the whole world has fallen apart. Yet your neighbor brings you a casserole or something, and that consoles you. Why? That's very strange. I mean, it, has, it, it doesn't change the fact that you suffered this terrible loss, but it's consoling. Um, so that's part of, I think, the mystery of consolation. It has to somehow, it counteracts the grief, even though it doesn't take it away. Um, and I think it probably, although I don't know if I could, how much I can say about this. I think that one of the reasons why, one of the things about liberal learning that I have have not said as much about as I would like to is that it, um, it seems to involve, in many cases, some kind of connection with with other human beings. They may be dead, okay? So you're you're reading a dead poet, or a um, you know a philosopher who you know who's been dead for a thousand years. Uh, but you connect with either the things that are being described or the person himself who's writing this book. And so there's a and there's a way in which there's a kind of human community that you enter into in the world of, of learning. And I think that's why it's consoling, because of that sense of community. Um, that might be one way. I mean, the other way I could go would be to think about the way I've talked more in the, that's in the talk is it's your dignity is in it somehow, like your sense of your humanity is in it. So if you're being diminished in some way, then you have your humanity. That also seems like a consolation. Anyway, those are just some thoughts. Yes. Hi. Uh, I would like to ask you if you find love a form of leisure or contemplation or both. Yes. I am. Um, again, there are other versions where there was uh, the uh, examples of uh, loving relationships as forms of leisure. Um, and I, I think that's in a way what I suspect is something that we find most natural and most common, right? Whether it's spending time with your family or with your, your partner, your beloved. Um, I think that, I, I'm not sure if I can defend this. I suspect there's something contemplative about that, about love. That is, it's, um, it's not acquiring something. It's not having something. It's somehow a way of understanding another person or a group of people or a human being as such. Um, so I, um, so yes, I want to, I want to include that in, um, in leisure. 
Um, so, the, and that, of course, is, I, I meant, the examples I just mentioned were particular, right? So ro romantic relationships or families or what have you. Um, I think it's also true that, um, right, there are other kinds of, like, larger gatherings, right? Like the community feasts or whatever. That could be a form of leisure. Uh, Peeper's example is liturgy. Um, so, uh, I don't know. But yes, I, I do accept that. Thank I'm, you. I am not anti-love. <laughs> <laughs> Even though it would be fun. It would be fun to me. <laughs> then I could, then I could, did I, I'd get more questions if I were. I could try it that way. <laughs> no. Uh, well, thanks uh, for the lecture. Um, well, recently I, I heard an interview, I think it was in a, a podcast, um, a view in which you talked about uh, liberal education. And if I'm not misquoting, I think you made the distinction between the, the ultimate goals of education and the desirable effects, the desirable effects being somewhat something like putting people on the job market and the ultimate goals being, well, what you told, um, yeah. the pursuit of freedom, of fundamental questions and so on and so forth and today I, I was actually talking with some colleagues at work about these ideas uh, with which I agree but they were asking in a very pragmatic way how could we change the system you know our educational system because eventually well not only does society need uh, people who have those technical skills you mentioned but uh, well eventually it's well we have to or most of us I have to um, work, you know, in a specific job eventually to pay the bills and uh, and etc. So, um, in a more realistic way, what would you suggest to somehow well change the way perhaps our education is designed towards? Um, I, so yeah, basically, I, I would just ask you to elaborate a little bit on that topic. Sure. Um, I so. My my writing is in my thinking about this is always tends to be quite general and idealistic, quite on purpose. It's not because I don't believe that um, it can or should be put into practice, but because the people's circumstances are so different, right? So here I am. I'm in a different co country from my home country, has a different educational system, and people in a variety of levels of education are going to have different experiences. People in different types of institutions are going to have different experiences. So I, it would be a whole different kind of work to be very practical. But I, I can say this on, on that question. I think that it's, it's actually very impractical to design educational programs for very specific jobs and tasks. It's impractical on the one hand because um, the, the market that requires those tasks can change in five years, 10 years. And then you have people that have been trained to do something that is no longer needed. But there's a deeper reason why I think it's um, impractical and also it, it connects to this, this freedom question, but in a, actually in a more obvious kind of political dimension. Um, you know, you, I don't think that what kind of thing a job is, to some extent, it's naturally something that's determined by other people. Okay, so <laughs> if I'm looking for a job, I've got to see what people want in terms of work. But if the whole society, the whole culture is set up so that, um, and of course, it's partly because the, the work is more and more concentrated and because there's fewer and fewer companies and they're global and so on. So there's, it's, mu it's much, much less differentiated. That means fewer and fewer people decide what counts as work. Um, and that, that seems to me very unhealthy and impractical from a political perspective. That is, you want people to, you want young people to be able to figure out what should count as work. They're not gonna always have complete power over how to, you know, they can't always invent their own jobs. But um, you can't have, the young just be these passive recipients of, you know, oh, okay, well, there's three kinds of jobs. There's engineering, there's coding, and there's marketing, and you can pick one. Uh, I mean, you, you should be able to say, well, I don't, I don't think that the things that we're engineering are good. I don't think the things that we're coding for are good, and I want to do something different. Um, and there ought to be vehicles within a culture and a society for that to happen. So how that happens in practice, 
I don't know. I mean, I'm very, you know, I, I teach in what's called a great books program. Uh, they're quite rare in Europe, but they, they uh, there's one in Navarra in Spain. There's one that's starting in the Netherlands. There's a few here and there, one in Berlin. Um, but uh, I think there is a European tradition of the study of basic texts and fundamental questions. And I, I think it's in the history and the culture of most, of most countries. And it, I think trying to get back to something like that is going to be closer, uh, practically speaking, than um, this, um, this very narrow, narrow sense of what is practical. I mean, people have always had to learn specialized skills. I think my understanding is that, say, 50 years ago, you would have had your liberal arts education, and then a company would have hired you, and they would have taught you how to do it. Um, and I think we should be asking ourselves why that's not happening anymore. It's, it's not healthy for um, the state to be paying for the, the training of the company should be doing themselves. Anyway, I've gotten more into politics. But... Um, I was I was wondering, I'm basing myself on this talk alone because I hadn't heard of you before this uh, okay. lecture. Very good. That's but nice. uh, I was wondering how you would connect leisure, your description of leisure to vocation, not vocation as in, you know, finding your vocation, but vocation in terms of like calling you feeling fulfillment because you are existing or working for something outside of yourself. Wow, that's an amazing question. I've never gotten that question before, I don't think. Um, yeah, I, I think that if, if we're thinking of a vocation, I, I'm not sure exactly how you, how you mean vocation, but you mean like something that a, per, a person is particularly called to do, a mission or something like that? Yeah, well, a, yes, a sense of the thing that you do that you feel uh, would fulfill you or is part of who you are. I don't mean yeah. necessarily the thing that brings you money, but yeah, yeah. no, no, that I, I, I think that, um, there are a lot of different forms of leisure and ways of living it out. And I think that there is often one, which is a particular person's vocation and it usually is usually a form of leisure. The only, the only thing that makes me hesitate is that there, um, it's something that I'm a little uncomfortable with in my own thinking. It's not your fault. Uh, that um, you might be called to a particular form of service. So for instance, I think I have a call to be a teacher, okay? So that's a form of service. Um, and I'm totally myself and I'm a teacher. It absolutely fulfills who I am. But it's also, um, it's in a way not really leisurely. It's draining. I need to have some other resources that I go to, to restore myself. And most of the people, uh, people who I know who are social workers, they're also like that. They're doing exactly what they're supposed to be doing, but they, they need something else. And so um, I suspect that, the, that a vocation is complicated that way, and, and that part of it is really leisure for one's own sake, and the part of it is a kind of service. Um, but I, uh, that's, that's, I think, what I could say about it. Um, sorry, my English is really bad. Um, you say, if I remember well, that uh, you consider uh, work at the university as a leisure. But are you considering that because you are uh, uh, an inte intellectual person, you, you like to reading books, etc., um, or you consider that as a, as a general, a general, uh, uh, general thing? Uh, for, for, for example, I know, I know people that uh, didn't uh, enjoy reading. They think that's really boring. I think most most people, in fact, think think it is really boring. And they enjoyed uh, going uh, in the weekend to their uh, garage and uh, modify their mo motorcycle because it is the way to uh, to um, to uh, to having good to good time to to enjoy. Then uh, uh, maybe the, I'm I I didn't re read your book, so I'm, I'm not really good to judge, but. Maybe the fact that uh, you say uh, um, uh, you my my job university uh, it's f some things that uh, um, um, make me uh, um, that is a leisure for me may uh, 
may be just good for you. Uh, um, and I, I'm not, I don't know your, your audience, but um, maybe I think your audience is mainly people from a uh, university, maybe students, maybe a uh, teacher, etc. So, uh, uh, I, are, are you in your studying taking into account like maybe normal people, workers that maybe in, he, he, the guy is, in, is an engineer, he loves uh, making rockets, he thinks it is wonderful, it is, it is his purpose in life and he enjoys his work, truly enjoys his work and I don't know if you take that to pay. I think this lady, uh, uh, should we talk about that? Thank you, that's a wonderful question. Um, yeah, I, um, let me say this first of all. So, um, I have a particular background, you're quite right, I'm an I'm a, a academic, a university teacher, professional intellectual, a lifelong bookworm. So I have a special interest in um, intellectual life, life of the mind, reading, studying, thinking. Um, and my work is focused on that in a way also because it's what I know the best and because it's important for the structure of universities and because it's in terrible condition almost everywhere. <laughs> so, um, but I, I think, and I think I'm a bit more careful in the book than I am in this uh, talk um, to account for, to, to, as best I can, I mean, how could you ever account for the huge variety of human experience and human desires? But I try. So um, absolutely, people may um, have a deep love of the t working on motorcycles um, or uh, making rockets. And I think that there can be a leisure in that also. So there's a, again, a type of contemplation, a way of seeing how the world fits together, a kind of a, a, a pleasure in, in, in thinking about things for its own sake. It's almost mathematical. Um, it's also true though, and this I think might be the, maybe you would want to disagree with me. So I'm not going to, I'm not, I would never say, oh, absolutely everyone must, read books. Maybe they don't, maybe they really are people who just really in the end will never like it. But I do think, especially now, there are many more people who would enjoy the life of the mind, who are not exposed to it, and who do not encounter it. So I do try to evangelize for it, so to speak, because engineers, for instance, uh, engineers in the US, when I go to speak at universities, the room is full of engineers. They're the people reading philosophy and literature, not anyone else. Uh, the, they're the, the people who are in STEM, they are absolutely on fire to, in their spare time to read everything else. Or you, I've heard so many stories that people have told me about their uncle who was a mechanic who had never gone, to, who had dropped out of high school and read all of Shakespeare and knew everything about, I don't know, insects. Uh, so there, there are real people like this and um, so it's important to me to to be to offer this particular activity that that I love. It it is niche probably, but it's not as niche as people think it is, and it's losing its grip on the culture because of the techno of uh, phones and technology. And I think it's important that it be re brought back to the extent that it can be. But I I mean no. I mean no contempt for all of the varieties of human contemplation and thinking. I think of it very broadly. I, I admire it very much, but it's, um, but I, I focus it this way for these reasons. Does that help? Thank you. Okay. One last question. Ooh, that's a responsibility. Um, so, I, if I'm understanding, you, you talk a bit in terms of separating these two realities. So you withdraw so you can self-recover from the harms of being in a society. Harms, not such a good word. But so, uh, Do you think that if we could bring uh, 
what we took from the withdrawal and contaminate the environments we go back to, that maybe something would change? Is that happening already? Do you think it's natural or is something that we have to work to? And could that be an expression of vocation maybe? Um, I don't know if this makes sense. I, th I, think, I think it makes sense. I think I've understood you. So, and it is something that I think uh, I don't always communicate as clearly as I should. I do think that withdrawal in my, this is my own uh, instinct. Withdrawal is for the sake of engagement. So it's, it's not somehow that you withdraw to this little special space. I mean, in a way that does really matter. It matters that that always has its integrity. But life is in, in the encounter, it's in uh, engagement. Um, and as I was saying earlier to Juana, um, you, you, um, you withdraw from this kind of false, harmful way of socializing and you get a different kind of connection. And yet, sure, I think that it could, that a, voc a vocation would look like that. Um, but that's quite general, right? How, how a particular person lives that out, I can't, I'm not in a position to say. Um, but I think that, uh, yeah, trying to connect with others on a basis of one's own freedom and dignity, that's, that's crucial. Um, is it actually happening now? I, it happens in all kinds of places, but it's not happening on a broad scale, but maybe, I don't know, well, who, who, sa who says, I don't know. Uh, if it happens only, the more it happens, the better. Uh, I don't have any plan for changing the world. So uh, next, n next time I come back, I'll tell you how to change the world. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so thank you, uh, Dina. Thank you all. Thank you. Now it's on. OK. Thank you, Dina, so much. Thank you all for coming. And thank you also to FLA, our sponsor today. And we can continue this wonderful conversation over some drinks and finger food and make me pose some informal questions if you want to. Bye. Yeah. <laughs>